Hello everyone, it is Dawn and I am here today with a different sort of video. It probably will be long. This is um, going to be an exploration video that I've actually wanted to talk about for a long time. I'm going to talk about the tribe of Benjamin. I'm going to have my glasses on and I will be reading some. I don't know if I will take the time to edit this video and make it more interesting. Yes, this um, has been on my heart for a very long time. All of my life I have uh, identified in my heart anyway with the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And of late that has been more in my awareness and I just wanted to come on here today and just share some with you um, from my heart. I'm going to read from various sources. If this gets long I will put timestamps below so you can you know jump to topics if you'd like. I realize this will not be of interest to everyone who follows me. That's fine. Just skip on by if it's not of interest. Um, in addition I want to say here at the beginning that I am not um, by any stretch of imagination a scholar. I really want to encourage you um, if you are wanting to approach this from a more academic level to do your own research. Just simply sharing what is of interest to me, what is in my heart and soul, um, and why I think it matters for this time that we are in right now. So the overarching idea here is to me is that we are in a time where so much is being revealed and many, many threads are being brought together. And for me, this includes the thread of what I um, see as the lost tribe of Benjamin and the full restoration and the uh, realization of the role that they have played throughout history. Um, they being all of those um, who are actual descendants of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes, and those who uh, were supported by them, and specifically this being the uh, the tribe of Judah and the lineage of Jesus and of uh, David, um, and Jesus as a son of David, um, and the uh, leader of the tribe of Judah um, and the restoration of the kingdom. So the role that Benjamin, the individual, played, the role that the tribe of Benjamin played, and the role that um, those who have characteristics that are shared either and come from the ancestral line lineage or have characteristics that or shared experience of these people. So the purpose of this is really just to explore all that and touch on it. And um, if you feel a resonance with it, to call you forward in this time to to make a choice and to stand in your rightful place and to be restored fully to the one love and the one kingdom. And this is about the healing of the nations. It is about the coming together of family. It is about no more division. It's about unity. It's about recognition. And it is about the heart broken open and offered up as gift to one another and no matter what tribe you associate or affiliate with or whether you don't have a resonance with any of that um, you know this is for all of us and this uh, the story here is a story of hope and faith and most of all of love so let's start with the life of Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin so both the life of the individual um, named Benjamin, for whom the tribe then was named, and the life of the tribe as a whole as it grew um, and, and shrunk actually through time. Um, both of those, the tribe and the individual, um, are really a study in contrast. There's uh, both the tribe and the individual is um, it's a story of conflict, but also a story of conversion. It is a story of darkness and of light. It is a story of a war within and a war without. And most of all, it is a story of redemption, and it is a story of restoration, and it is a story of, of triumph uh, and victory, but again, a gentle beautiful unfolding at the same time. So let's touch on this a little bit. So there are the characteristics of the individual and the, the tribe. So there is a vulnerability that is inherent in the story of Benjamin, the story of the tribe of 
of Benjamin, there's like often this sort of a vulnerability that turns into a hiding and a sense of shame or shamefulness. Um, and then there's also this, this sort of um, viciousness and a tendency to seize control or to, to, to take what you see as rightfully yours or what has been taken to take it back. Um, and so there emerges this picture of uh, Benjamin and the tribe that is associated with his name um, as uh, having quite predatory instincts um, and taking actions that would be considered by any measure of those actions violent. Um, and that action is sometimes taken in a heroic manner, uh, sometimes to defend the defenseless, but it is also sometimes, um, again, um, unprovoked um, anger. Um, at the same time, there's a level of skill associated with the tribe, particularly in terms of archery and uh, slingshot in the Bible. Um, and a, there, um, there's a tradition that... Um, they uh, learned to use their left hand as well as their right hand, so they became ambidextrous. So there's a level of shrewdness and skill associated with um, the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, the, the individual in the tribe are also often portrayed um, in a victim role, um, either a victim of circumstance or what appears to be a victim of circumstance, um, or someone who did not receive um, what is taken for granted by most people, um, and then often they are vilified um, out of jealousy uh, or sometimes just without cause. Um, and then at the same time, as there's this sort of like victim consciousness going on, there's this valiant warrior spirit, um, and they become the unlikely victor. So victim, victor. And then there's this um, a, 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 stream, a stream of uh, vile behavior um, that, you know, in the Bible, um, the tribe of Benjamin is associated with Sodomite, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, also associated with a later incident, very violent um, in incident that wipes out most of the tribe. Um, that is a battle. I'm forgetting the name now, but I'll touch on it later. Um, and it resulted, that battle, all the events that, that led up to that, uh, which began uh, with a um, something that even uh, by today's standards, which are quite loose, would be considered vile. Um, and, and yet that led to this rampant destruction and this, this you know, gory battle and the losses were, un, you know, it was, it was, it wiped them out, um, essentially. Um, and there was, you know, there's scandal throughout the history. Um, so again, there's this, this like level of, um, villain or vile behavior. And yet there is also the demonstration of great virtue. So it's really a study in, in wild contrast. If you really look at it in terms of the biblical record, but also just in terms of the um, characteristics, um, the more human psychological even characteristics of those who, who come from um, this origin um, or this, this family, this tribe. So let's look at the context for the 12 tribes of Israel. Like, what are the 12 tribes? The 12 tribes um, of Israel are uh, come from the sons, and, and some say grandsons, of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel by God after he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And I will link to um, a video I did earlier this year on that. And so this is the origin of the term Israelites. And so the 12 tribes of Israel directly came from the descendants of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. And so there are the, the three patriarchs of um, of the Old Testament in Judaism and Christianity. Christianity both recognize them and, for that fact, also Islam. So all of the monotheistic re religions. Of the 12 tribes, Joseph and Benjamin were the two youngest sons of, of Jacob, and they were the sons of Jacob and Rachel, and Rachel, the only sons of Rachel. Um, and uh, Jacob also fathered sons by Leah, his first wife, or Leah, Leah, and then also by two concubines. And if you read the story of how he had to labor for uh, essentially two seven-year periods, I believe it was 14 years, um, to um, be able to even be with Rachel. And so here at the very end of her life, she gives birth to Benjamin, the 12th of 12 sons. 
So he was the youngest son. He was also the only son to be born in what is uh, today Palestine. It was then the promised land. It was the land of Canaan. It was across the river Jordan. And this is where when Moses led the, the people, the tribes out of captivity in Egypt and they wandered in the desert for 40 years, they were they were in search of the promised land, the land that was promised to them. Uh, and there's a beautiful story that I really encourage you to read um, the entirety of Genesis and Exodus and really the, the first five books of the, of the Bible, though it can get a little bit bogged down there um, in, in Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy. But, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful story of redemption, of of the Exodus. Oh, and also Canaan. Let me touch on something interesting to me anyway here. Um, Canaan actually means, so the land of Canaan, the promised land um, that the, the 12 tribes were led to. Canaan actually means the land of purple. It's also associated with the Phoenicians. Um, and it was a center of trade um, in in the um, early times. It was, it was large and it was prosperous. And it's uh, where modern day Lebanon and Syria and Jordan are located. Many scholars um, say that the name Canaan has to do with the Hebrew Cana, K-A-N-A, which means to be brought into synchronicity. And there's also a theory that um, says that uh, the name Canaan uh, or Canaan comes from the Hebrew uh, Cana, which uh, also means order from chaos or a blending. And I find this to be very beautiful in terms of the time we are living in now. Um, and in my belief anyway, that the, the 12 tribes are being brought back together in the family of humanity, in fact, is is being uh, brought together and we together who are leading the way are ushering in a whole new era, rich in love and a whole new way forward together to include um, a whole new way forward together through relationships redefined as sacred partnership, uh, which as it was in the beginning. So I just find that so fascinating that it was called the promised land itself. Uh, was called the land of purple. That's what the name perhaps means. And also this idea of synchronicity um, and things being brought together. And the very fact that the River Jordan and, um, and that the 12 tribes were led to this land, yet Benjamin was the only of the 12 born um, in that land. So um, I'm going to skip around a little bit just to give you a context, then we'll dive a little deeper into each one of these. Uh, Benjamites, along with the other tribes, are given uh, lands um, and rewarded uh, by, by lot. And uh, Benjamin is given a territory that would later become absolutely critical and central in uh, the biblical narrative, and yet uh, that fact is often lost. So the land that was granted to Benjamin included modern day Jerusalem, Jericho, and Benjamin and Judah were the only um, two in the in the southern kingdom of Judah. And then the rest of uh, the ten tribes went to Israel. And interestingly, Benjamin was the one that was the, made the choice of where to go and chose to go with Judah against all odds um, because could have exerted its um, influence and power much more had they gone with the, the other ten tribes in the northern kingdom. So just a little context for you. So um, from the point that the tribe of Benjamin made that decision to go with the tribe of Judah in the southern kingdom, there was really an assimilation that occurred and the tribe of Benjamin was all but subsumed by or, um, or enveloped in the tribe of Judah. And so there has been little distinction from that point forward, particularly after the Babylonian captivity, when the, uh, Judah and, and Benjamin, the, the tribes that were in the southern kingdom, were um, it was absolutely conquered, taken over. Um, the um, temple was destroyed, I believe. I think that's correct. But in any case, they were taken into captivity. And from this point on, um, the tribe of Benjamin essentially lost its identity. Uh, and there's very, it's very difficult to trace from that point forward, and they are, they are scattered to all of the earth. And um, according to biblical tradition also, um, the um, Benjamin and Judah are the two tribes that later became um, the core of the, the Jewish people. 
So the attributes that are uh, of the tribe itself give us an indication of what it is that these people were here to heal in the way that I'm looking at it anyway, in terms of the ancestral patterns. Um, and again, I'm struck by the contrast here. It's very clear and evident, um, you know, if you even read the historical record um, and the narrative that is in the Bible that we have, those uh, texts and also many other texts, um, it becomes very clear, the characteristics. So they were known, you know, for their warrior skills, again, bow and arrow and slingshot primarily, but ironically also for their quiet strength and even in some cases their serenity, which seems like a, a polar opposite, has been associated with those from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, one source uh, said this, which I, I really, uh, this resonated for me, is that they had known the depths of depravity and so too they had the opposite quality of being able to reach the greatest heights of virtue. Uh, this is very much my own personal experience and the reason that I resonate with uh, this larger um, larger group and certainly would be um, something that I know that I am here to touch upon, whether it is around me in my inner circle or in my own life or reflected back to me in society you know, my tendency to want to push it away. And of course, what happens when we reject or deny um, or do not deal with something, it crops right up. You know, it may show up in a different form, but um, but Jesus' teachings were all about that, weren't they? And so anyway, I found that quote interesting that I ran across. So they were also a modest people and yet very proud. Um, they were clan-like and, you know, just like fiercely uh, protective and identified with the group or the family or the society, and yet they could, uh, so in that sense, there was a lot of self-sacrifice that went on for the family, the clan, the group, the cause, um, and yet they could be equally fierce in their fight for independence and for a cause um, or a belief, even singularly so, stand for something that they truly believed in. Um, they're, they're also known for um, a vast sexual ap appetite and, and lust, um, and yet also a deep and honorable love and loyalty. Um, they are often found supporting the number one candidate, um, so as in associ their associated association with the tribe of Judah, also as in the story of David, because both Jonathan, his best friend, um, and um, is it uh, Mikkel, I believe is her name, who falls in love with King David. Both Mikkel and Jonathan, brother and sister, are the children of Saul, the first king of Israel, and all of these were from the tribe of Benjamin, Saul and Jon Jonathan and Mikkel. And so, or Michael, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, yet, so the tribe is known again for um, often, you know, supporting those who hold the light um, and um, are bringing forth good. Um, and without this support, one wonders if uh, the story would have been the same. And yet, even as they um, support, you know, such causes um, and stand for a greater um, good, they also uh, you know, are unafraid to stand alone, as I mentioned, or even die for what they believe in uh, and die alone. And uh, you know, at one point they hide in caves. Um, and so there, yet even as, um, there's, uh, there's also a contrast in terms of their um, instinct. They're very much about instinct. And I'll touch on this a little bit later when I talk about Jacob's blessing in particular in the story of the wolf. They're known for that keen, keen instinct, quick action, um, maybe too quick, um, but also they can be observers who bide their time and who know more than they let on. The stone associated with the tribe of Benjamin is the jasper, and a particularly a particular kind of jasper that has been described as containing all of the colors. Um, similarly, the banner of the tribe of Benjamin uh, it does have the wolf, which we'll learn about here in a sec, but it also was colored like all the colors to include the 12 colors, and a wolf was illustrated upon it. So the tribe of Benjamin was the smallest tribe, in addition to Benjamin being the youngest of the 12 sons, it was the smallest tribe. But the first king of Israel, Saul, came from the tribe of Benjamin, so the very foundations of the kingdom of Israel. 
legend, um, so I have no idea if this is accurate, but legend associates um, the tribe of Benjamin with um, the Jewish population in Germany and Romania, the Belgians, um, Normandy and France, um, French Canadians, and even I, one source attributes uh, um, their lineage to the West Indies. So um, let's look at the person of Benjamin, the youngest of the 12 sons for whom the 12 tribes of Israel were named. He was born of sorrow and he was born a stranger in a strange land and yet a land of promise. So here's what uh, the story says in Genesis chapter 35. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel, his wife, began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you will have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni but his father named him Benjamin. So first, a little uh, context. According to classical rabbinical sources in the Jewish tradition, Benjamin was only born after Rachel had fasted for a very long time. And Benjamin and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rachel and Jacob were up in, in years. In fact, uh, Jacob was 100 years old. Rachel fasted for a long time as a religious devotion with the hope that a new child would be born. And the reward of this child did come, but she lost her life giving birth. And so she named him Benoni, which means child of sorrow, child of my sorrow, um, or the son of my sorrow. And so Benjamin is born and his mother dies in childbirth and his father is a hundred years old. So Rachel names him Benoni and this was the last thing she did before she died. She named her last child the son of my sorrow. Uh, and yet, of course, he was a gift. And But Benjamin never knew the love of a mother. He grew up, you know, and was raised presumably by his aunt Leah. Jacob's first wife and, and the two concubines who were, who were also living, but he grew up without a mother. And, you know, from the beginning, there was this, you know, uh, inference that he was, uh, uh, on the one hand, a bit forgotten and, you know, strayed um, and, you know, because he didn't have that, that guidance, got into trouble, and it took him a long time to grow up and become a man. And yet, on the other side, you know, he had this father who was 100 years old when the last of his 12 sons were born. And Jacob renamed Benjamin almost immediately, rather than son of my sorrow, Benoni. He named him, or yeah, Benoni, he named him Benjamin, which uh, in Hebrew means son of my right hand. Now, some scholars suggest that this refers to the, the fact that Benjamin was the only child born in the land of Canaan, um, and so it was more reference to the land uh, and where the land was situated. The name Benjamin comes from Jacob's renaming of the child, son of my right hand. And so when, when uh, Benjamin was a child, Jacob you know, probably naturally became quite overprotective of him because he lost his son, Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. Um, although maybe there's, it's disputable whether Jacob knew that uh, or not in the beginning. But Benjamin was the only child left of his beloved Rachel, who had died in childbirth. And so Jacob was perhaps overprotective on the one hand, and yet here he was a very, a, you know, an old man, even by the standards of that day, with this this child. And consider that. Uh, consider what Benjamin's upbringing might have been, and the difficulties of that. Consider also his his older brother, beloved older brother and protector, Joseph. His brother Joseph was sold into slavery, and you know, in the Quran, uh, Benjamin, the uh, Muslim scriptures, um, Benjamin is referred to 
as a righteous young child who, you know, remains with Jacob when um, the older brothers are plotting against Joseph. So Benjamin's not there. And, you know, consider that. Consider how this all unfolded and the grief that must have been within this child. I'll leave it there. By this point, Joseph is off in Egypt, and the brothers, there's a time of famine, and the brothers uh, are traveling to Egypt. They want to take um, Benjamin back into Egypt um, on a second trip. And so when Jacob learns of this in, in chapter 42 of Genesis, he says, um, he, he learns that there's grain in Egypt. And he says, <clears throat> you know, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down and get some. And the ten, ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, the eleventh of the twelve who was left with him, Joseph's brothers, with the other, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So he was very uh, attached to Benjamin and a bit overprotective. So later, when the brothers want to take Benjamin back to Egypt, um, where uh, Joseph, who was once sold as a slave, is now a ruler in the kingdom uh, during a time of great famine in the lands around Egypt and in Egypt. Um, Jacob refuses and he says, you know, no, my son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead because he thinks Joseph is dead at this point. And he, Benjamin, is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. And then when he finally does relent and let Benjamin go, um, you know, it's reluctantly. And, and then later in his life, the whole family is reunited with Joseph. And, uh, but what happens there is when um, Benjamin does go with the brothers, Joseph has this plan to kind of test the brothers. And so he plants secretly a silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And then he publicly, you know, kind of searches the bags, finds the cup. Um, and in, in Benjamin's bag, and he, he demands that Benjamin become his slave. It's this sort of you know show, uh, and as punishment for stealing, presumably the the silver cup. Um, and um, the narrative goes on to state that when Judah, the older brother, on behalf of the other brothers, begs Joseph not to enslave Benjamin for his father's sake, um, and and says that the enslavement of Benjamin would break Jacob's, their father's heart. Um, this causes Joseph to have compassion and to recant and reveal his true identity. And some of the, the classical sources, Jewish sources, argue that, that Joseph actually identifies himself for other reasons. And in one of these, it is because Benjamin swore an oath on the memory of Joseph, his brother, that he was innocent of theft. And when he was challenged about how believable that would be, he explains how remembering Joseph was so important to him that he had named all of his sons in Joseph's honor. So Benjamin, as a man, has honored this brother that he barely knew. And, and the, can you imagine the grief that he must have experienced? And he's named all of his sons after Joseph. As a matter of fact, I want to go ahead and read that now to you. Um, let me find that. The sons of Benjamin, and what a legacy of love this was, and a testament to his character, the character of Benjamin. He named his ten sons. The first was named Bela, meaning swallow, in reference to Joseph disappearing or being swallowed up. He named the second son Betcher, meaning firstborn, in reference to Joseph being the first child of Rachel. He named his third son Ashbel, meaning capture, in reference to Joseph having suffered captivity. He named his fourth child Gera, meaning grain, in reference to Joseph living in a foreign land, Egypt. He named his fifth son Naaman, meaning grace, in reference to Joseph having graceful speech. He named his sixth son Ehi, meaning my brother, in reference to Joseph being Benjamin's only full brother, as opposed to his other half-brothers. He named the next son Rosh, meaning elder, in reference to Joseph being older than Benjamin. The next son was named Muppin, meaning double mouth, in reference to Joseph passing on what he had been taught by Jacob to Benjamin. Uh, he named the next son Huppin, meaning marriage canopies, in reference to Joseph being married in Egypt while Benjamin was not there. And he named his tenth son Ard, meaning wanderer or fugitive, in reference to Joseph being like a rose. So, so beautiful. I just find that 
incredibly moving. And when I consider the story of Benjamin, the boy, who eventually became a man but carried this in his heart all the while, and in many ways I believe all of those from the tribe of Benjamin identify with that in some way whatever their individual story. So I just wanted to take a moment to share that. I think I find it so beautiful. So um, back in Egypt, you know, so Joseph finally reveals himself and no longer pretended to be a stranger. And in the story is the reason that he did that was that this oath that Benjamin took and, and how Benjamin had carried his love for his brother all of these years without him. Just so beautiful. So um, also in the... Um, uh, rabbinic tradition, there is a story that names Benjamin of all people with all of the, the things that I'll share in a moment and that we know of his history, which was um, quite tainted. Um, there is a story yet that names Benjamin as one of four ancient Israelites who died without sin. So when Rachel names her son she breaks a pattern that was a traditional pattern uh, of Jacob's other wife, uh, wives, Leah and the two concubines, but also her own herself with her son Joseph. She followed the tradition of naming her ch all of the children um, as an expression of hope. Um, and rather than do that here with Benjamin, she uh, names him from a place of fear and she just She's tired, maybe, and she knows she's dying, or she just names him from a place of, you know, some would say fear or a, a lesser, uh, less positive emotion anyway. Um, yet um, her choice to name him as she does is full of honesty and truth. It accurately, you know, kind of uh, paints a portrait of real life. Uh, it doesn't try to cut corners or um, put on a facade. And it also, it also speaks to Rachel's story, you know, and her love for Jacob, and yet, you know, what never materialized in some ways um, for them in terms of, of a home and roots and um, the uh, happy ever after uh, that they, they both so wanted with one another. And so, you know, one can imagine that, that Benjamin perhaps carried this from both his mother and his father's perspective in his heart, knowingly or unknowingly, and that this might have affected his upbringing. And then, you know, we look at Jacob renaming um, the child Ben Yamin. Um, and again, Yamin has been uh, associated with the word the South, uh, which the Southern Kingdom, um, which Benjamin followed uh, and went with uh, Judah, his older brother. And it also is true that the family was, was traveling south when uh, Benjamin was born. Um, and, the, you know, the, the pregnancy came to its, uh, in the fullness of time, as they say, and she gave birth before they reached their destination. And again, um, the first of uh, Jacob's children to be born in the Promised Land and perhaps named uh, in part in honor of and recognition of, of the land. We just don't know. But I want to talk about Jacob's blessing because it's... Um, quite interesting. So, you know, to me, uh, the story of Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin, it's a story of uh, being in search of one's own identity. It's certainly something I can relate to in my own personal journey. It's, it's almost a fighting for the right to exist, the ability to breathe, to be here, to, to live, and, you know, to live it all and then to dare to live in full expression. But there's also sort of like overtones of that birthright stolen because um, in some traditions, the tribe of Benjamin is um, meant to fight off the tribe of uh, or the descendants of Esau. So there's that legacy too. But Jacob's blessing, a father's blessing to his child was this to Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. And there are lots of various interpretations of this. You know, for me, I immediately am, you know, calls to mind the story of the two wolves within us of the Native American tradition. 
so the tribe, the ben, uh, tribe of Benjamin became known for its ferocity in battle, which, you know, definitely goes along with this uh, ravenous wolf, you know, kind of picture. Um, and then this idea of dividing the spoils. Um, some interpret that to be sharing and, and the second phase of his journey where there was, uh, and in, in terms of the uh, tribe itself as well, where there's sort of a redemption and a supporting and an honoring and a sharing to the greater good. You know, so again, there's these two stories perhaps that are going on here. And the uh, Saul, the first king of Israel, did come from the tribe of Benjamin, and yet um, soon after that, they lost control of the kingdom, and then Judah comes in, uh, the tribe of Judah, um, and leads through King David, and then the lineage that eventually led to Yeshua ben Joseph, Jesus, son of Joseph, um, descendant of the house of David. For me, also, this wolf um, connection is significant because, in, uh, you know, if you follow me, you know I've uh, talked about a wolf that uh, was in the life of Mary Magdalene named Gray, who was the protector of the son of Yeshua and Mary Magdalene as I, you know, as it lives in my soul, the story, and uh, the child was killed when he was 12, and Gray was the wolf that stood by them, and and also I've uh, painted wolves, and I've had uh, wolf has energy has been interesting in my life at various moments. So there's you know that connection for me personally. Many of the commentaries um, that speak to this prophecy or this blessing that Jacob gave to his son Benjamin, they touch on this and they uh, some make links even to others from the tribe of Benjamin to include, which I'll talk about this later, but to include the Apostle Paul and how he, in the early part of his life, was the persecutor and wreaked havoc in, in, in the church. And then in the later part of his life, the, the, he spent his days dividing um, the spoils that were uh, gathered up um, and, and and dispersing them into the the churches. In other words, taking uh, the prey that had been seized uh, by uh, Satan or you know his own Paul's own actions uh, when he was Saul. Interesting name there as well. He was named after Saul. So there was this contrast in the life of uh, of the great apostle Paul as well. And so some commentaries refer to that uh, and others from the tribe of Benjamin and how there are these two two faces. And again, uh, for me, completely consistent with the contrast that you see in, in the person of Benjamin, in the tribe of Benjamin, and many of those who have walked that journey, um, and myself included. So there, there's an interesting thing in one of these commentaries. Uh, I found this interesting that many believe that there were overtones on the tribe of Benjamin in terms of the life of Christ. Now, while Jesus was not from the tribe of Benjamin, I personally believe that, that Magdalene was, but and was with him. There is uh, an association with the, the verses that are given in the, the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy in particular, where there is a, there are references to um, to the light and then, and then the one that supports the lion and who is... Uh, given the um, uh, capacity to divide the spoils uh, with the strong um, in, in any case. I'm not going to go into all that, but there, there's some really interesting threads there. So the tribe of Benjamin did become, indeed become as ravenous wolves um, in, in horrifying ways um, that you can't dispute, and also equally in very honorable and courageous ways and I would argue that that continues to this day with many who operate uh, and who have been judged by perhaps things that are less than honorable that either they themselves participated in or that happened around them and the perception is that they are that um, and so it's, it's almost as a mantle is thrown onto them and has been uh, and yet there is uh, something quite honorable and quite uh, integral to the story that we are living um, that the tribe of Benjamin brings forth. So they're often tainted by temptation and by others in their midst that sometimes they wrongly protect. And there are difficult lessons around discernment for those who identify with the, the, the tribe of Benjamin. And there's, there are points, you know, in the story uh, of, of all of us who identify with this lineage where everything goes up in smoke, like literally everything is destroyed. And it's like, how did this happen? How did this happen? And then often we are driven into hiding or there is a, um, it's as if we become invisible, we're wiped out, our story is stolen. There is a, a um, um, 
that cloaking. Uh, there's uh, a hijacking of the story in some instances and in other instances just a uh, concealment um, and a devaluing of the role. Um, and yet some of that is, uh, it's complicated. It's a complicated story. That's what I'm saying. It's a complicated story of contrast. Um, and it's a story ultimately of God's redemption. So the blessing of Moses um, on Benjamin, um, the tribe of Benjamin, is uh, it's portrayed as prophecy, and it's about the future situation of the 12 tribes. And so it speaks to redemption um, and the story of redemption that we see in the life of Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin. And um, in particular, it talks about uh, the tribe being brought back to rest between the shoulders of the Lord and thereby finding its restoration and its rightful home. Um, Deuteronomy 33, I uh, don't remember the verse, but it says this, the blessing of Moses, uh, the man of God pronounced upon the Israelites before his death. About Benjamin, he said, let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him for he shields him all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. So there's a you know a wide, a wide variety of explanations for what this really meant. This between the shoulders, you know, some see it quite uh, literally as a reference to the geographical location of the tribe of Benjamin. As I've mentioned, very significant. Um, cities and it's sandwiched right between the kingdom of Judah in the south um, and the other ten tribes, the kingdom of Israel and the northern kingdom, and uh, encompasses um, Jerusalem, interestingly, and so some believe it refers to Jerusalem itself and the, the temple of God, the holy sanctuary, the, the, the sacred uh, holy of holies that's there um, in Jerusalem in the center of the kingdom uh, or the land that was given to Benjamin. Um, and um, others um, think that it was uh, a reference, you know, more metaphorical to um, God as shielding um, Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin and bringing them. There, there is this idea of nevertheless, whatever it refers to, of um, the, the restoration and the redemption and that God will shield um, shield them. There's also an, an interesting interpretation that actually is um, saying that Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin is the one that will shield um, the others. So um, in any case, it was um, uh, an interesting blessing that is uh, speaks to the future of the tribe of Benjamin. I also want to reference the land that was given and how that occurred. It's in Joshua chapter 18. Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord, and there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. The first lot came up for the tribe of Benjamin according to its clans. Their allotted territory lay between the tribes of Judah and Joseph. It describes the actual territory given to the tribe of Benjamin. So yet, yeah, despite these territories been given to the, being given to the tribe of Benjamin, they, uh, the town of Jerusalem itself uh, remained under the control of the Canaanites. And then Joshua, who you know, gave Bethel to the tribe of Benjamin and, and the clan as, of Benjamin, um, and yet by the time the prophetess Deborah is writing, not long after this, it's clear that it has been taken by the tribe of Ephraim. And so also what was once the land belonging to, to Benjamin was later subsumed again by the kingdom of Judah, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So there's this, uh, this land that is given, but the, the lands are lost. So not only are the people scattered and there's um, the loss of um, so much, um, and from the beginning of the life of Benjamin, there, of course, are the, the losses. So this loss is carried through the story as well. So in spite of, you know, what was given being lost um, and what was granted being taken um, and at times having never known um, what so many of the other tribes took for granted, uh, there, God always had a plan for the, the quote, lost tribe of Benjamin. Um, when Solomon, son of David, built the temple, 
um, and you know, in, ushered in a, a great era in terms of the kingdom of, um, uh, of Israel. Uh, there was a time, though, at which he, he had a thousand wives and he was going astray. And uh, 1 Kings 11 describes this you know, scene. And it says, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom with, from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And who did God choose to give to the kingdom of Judah? The tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin remained a part of the kingdom of Judah until Judah was conquered by Babylon, as I mentioned. That happened around 586 B.C., um, and then, you know, the population was deported off. They went off to uh, the Babylonian captivity. And when the southern, uh, so the southern kingdom was destroyed and essentially the tribe of Benjamin, you know, kind of faded from history. And, and really there's not much more of any kind of consistent narrative. And so imagine that when, for a tribe um, which clan and family had been so important and, you know, to a fault even while the tribe of Judah established the kingdom, and then from that comes Jesus. Could it have happened without uh, God granting the support uh, to the tribe of Judah um, by the tribe of Benjamin being there? Uh, there's a, a beautiful verse, I don't remember the reference right now, but about uh, Benjamin being the light that was held up, um, which again, just coming from you know such a dark history um, and such a, um, a lost narrative. Um, to this is, is beautiful. It's a beautiful part of the story that um, I feel gets lost. So uh, who is of the tribe of Benjamin? You know, uh, certainly I believe any of us who are listening and who resonate with it, then, then there's a reason for that, whether we are, you know, genetically and, and uh, you know, tied or linked to that tradition or in a more uh, metaphorical way, you, we understand this, this aspect of what it is to be human. There is something of importance here. So in addition to Saul, the first king of Israel, uh, and his son, Jonathan, uh, his, uh, and his daughter, uh, Michal, Jonathan was the presumed rival for the crown, and yet he acknowledged David as the true king. And that took, that takes, just think about that. Just think about that. If you have the opportunity to be king and yet you know and you, you acknowledge um, the other as king and he, he had, and to his dying day, David had Jonathan's full support. It says, you know, in 1 Samuel um, chapter 18, uh, it says, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And then uh, Michal, or Michael, the daughter of Saul, who deeply loved uh, David and had no qualms about um, speaking that or showing that, demonstrating that. And, you know, here she was, a single woman that certainly was not accepted uh, in this time. And yet she, it was, there was a, a fierceness and a purity to that love. The Bible, Mordecai, um, and in the book of Esther, and Esther the queen herself, who was Hadassah, though they were both from the tribe of Benjamin, and that's a beautiful, beautiful story. If you aren't familiar with it, I invite you to read that um, in the book of Esther. As I mentioned, the apostle Paul was uh, he himself, um, you know, boasts of his uh, lineage from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, you can read that in Romans chapter eleven and also in the book of Philippians. He he mentions this, and so you know, Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles, and there is a definite tradition of the tribe of Benjamin being associated with uh, reaching the Gentiles in a way that none of the other tribes can. Um, and yeah, there's much more to be explored there, but I'm gonna leave that for another time. Um, uh, two hummingbirds just showed up.
So that's really cool, especially because I was about to mention that I, I personally believe, I don't know that there's any historical evidence for this, but I personally believe that, that Magda, Mary Magdalene, uh, was also of the tribe of Benjamin and that her role in Yeshua's life was, uh, again, of of the one that is often not seen in history, but who is shining a light to the one who is the light to the nations. So there's that as well. Paul, when he was writing about his um, his association with the tribe of Benjamin, he says, uh, he says, as I said, he says, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So, you know, he's boastful there, but uh, making the point, you know, that of who he is. And so here he was, clearly from the 12 tribes of the tribe of Benjamin, um, and and here he is called out to to be a light to the Gentiles, uh, be one who communicates the gospel of Jesus. And in many ways, I do see um, Paul, the apostle. Um, you guys have heard me talk about this before, and uh, Magdalene, both um, as uh, representing two very different streams, but of equal uh, equal importance in many ways to. Um, sharing the story of Jesus. More links them together than divides them. And that's basically the story for me um, of the tribe of Benjamin and Benjamin's legacy um, to us. It's, it's about um, a union, that sacred union within our own hearts and souls and coming to an inner balance, learning which wolf to feed, if you will, um, but also using the highest gifts of who one is as a soul in the highest possible way to shine a light on, on the one true light that is always coming into the world. So that was um, my soul share on the tribe of Benjamin. I hope there was something there for you. I um, just really invite you to think about um, the one love that unites us all um, and allow all division to be brought into the light and allow yourself to um, taste of the river of love that flows forward from the heart of Benjamin broken open and his story and the tribe of Benjamin still longing for its reconciliation with the other tribes and with the one love. Thanks.